Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bachelor Prize session of ICTAM 2020 plus one. My name is Nadine Aubrey. I'm IUTAM Vice President and Past President, and I'm delighted to be the chair of this session, honoring both George Bachelor and this year's prize winner, Professor Lex Metz. First, to give you some background on the prize itself, George Bachelor was born and raised in Melbourne, Australia, and received his undergraduate degree from the University of Melbourne. He then moved to Cambridge for his doctoral work under G.I. Taylor and remained at Cambridge for the rest of his life. As we all know, Bachelor is considered the most influential fluid dynamicist over the past century and for several reasons. The first reason is his groundbreaking research in fluid mechanics, particularly homogeneous turbulence and microhydrodynamics. In addition, in 1956, Bachelor founded the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, known as JFM, which he edited for almost 30 years and which has become the most highly regarded and influential journal in the field of fluid mechanics. Last year, in the centennial of George Bachelor's birth, Cambridge University Press announced the new journal Flow, a sister journal to JFM, addressing application <clears throat> in fluid mechanics. It had long been Bachelor's vision that such a journal be established. In 1959, Bachelor was the founding head of the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics in Cambridge, which has become a world leading department. Finally, Bachelor co founded the European Mechanics Society, EuroMAC, and also played a prominent role in IUTAM. I'm now delighted that this year's Bachelor Prize is being awarded to my longtime colleague and friend, Professor Lex Smith, who also grew up in Melbourne and also received his undergrad degree from the University of Melbourne, where he stayed to receive his PhD. Later, Lex joined Princeton University, where he's now the Eugene Higgins Professor of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Lex is known worldwide as an outstanding scholar, educator, and leader. His research in fluid mechanics has been broad, addressing problems in turbulence, supersonic and hypersonic flows, bio-inspired flows, and the aerodynamics of sports. In particular, Lex has achieved truly transformative research in high Reynolds number of flows, warm bounded flows in particular, developing world unique facilities along the way. Lex is the author of several books, including Turbulent Shear Layers in Compressible Flows, and also the very popular undergraduate textbook, A Physical Introduction to Fluid Mechanics. For his outstanding contributions, Lex has received numerous major awards and is a member of both the National Academy of Engineering and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has served as an associate editor of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics, and more, and more recently has been the editor-in-chief of the AIAA Journal. It is now my honor and great pleasure to invite Professor Lex Metz to deliver the Bachelor Prize Lecture and discuss his seminal work on measurements in more founded turbulence. Lex. Thank you, Nadine. This is a, a very kind and uh, a rather daunting introduction that you've uh, made for me. Um, it's, it's, of course, a spectacular uh, pleasure to be awarded this uh, prestigious prize. Um, you know, as a, as a fellow Australian, George Bachelor was kind of a mythical figure um, doing remarkable things uh, in fluid mechanics all the way from you know, uh, writing a, a wonderful textbook to doing some of the most seminal work in turbulence and, and, and two-phase flows. And of course, his leadership in the community is, is been remarkable. So it's, 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 uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm truly humbled by uh, being awarded this lecture, this, this prize. 
And it, it puts a lot of pressure on me to give a decent lecture and I'm going to give it a try. So um, my topic today, oh, by the way, I should also thank, of course, Cambridge University Press and the Journal of Fluid Mechanics for making this prize possible. Uh, a wonderful thing indeed. So my topic today is uh, measurements in uh, wall bounded turbulence. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is I'm going to look at um, canonical wall bounded flows. Uh, as Tony Perry used to say, canonical means saintly. They're saintly wall bounded flows. Um, three examples, fully developed channel flow of a high aspect ratio. Characteristic dimension would be the half height of the channel, H. Um, a fully developed pipe flow where the characteristic dimension is the radius, R. And a boundary layer on a flat plate zero pressure gradient where the characteristic dimension is the uh, boundary layer thickness uh, delta. All the flows are turbulent. We assume that uh, Reynolds number is sufficiently high and they are free of history effects. So the theme that I wanted to advance was uh, to talk about how advances in experimental techniques and computation have contributed to improving our understanding of these wall-bounded uh, turbulent flows. And I'm going to use three examples um, just to think about Reynolds number scaling first, both the mean flow and the turbulence in these, uh, these kinds of flows, and then extend that to Mach number scaling by considering uh, the behavior of supersonic and hypersonic boundary layers. There's some notation involved. If I look at a boundary layer, for example, on the, on the left there with a boundary layer thickness of delta, the wall distance is Y, that's measured from the wall. And at some height, there is a velocity uh, a field, flow velocity fluctuation. And I'm gonna really concentrate on the streamwise component that's denoted by U. It has a mean and a fluctuating component. And uh, I'm going to almost exclusively talk about non-dimensional uh, uh, versions of this so that U plus is the uh, mean velocity divided by U tau. And U tau is a very important velocity scale it's defined in terms of the wall shear stress, tau wall, divided by the density at the wall. And if you take the square root of that, that has the dimensions of velocity, and that's a very convenient velocity scale for these wall bounded flows. And I'm also going to use that, of course, the same velocity scale to non-dimensionalize the turbulence intensity, which is uh, uh, the mean square of the velocity fluctuation. And the plus signs are always non-dimensional variables using UTAL. So I'm going to frame this talk in terms of some concepts or ideas. So we have some ideas of what we know or what we think we know what to expect in, uh, in this case, incompressible flows. And so the first thing you might uh, uh, list as one of these sorts of known things is uh, that far from the surface, the motion scale with the flow thickness, delta R or H. And in the boundary layer pictures on the right from Campbell, Coles and Dimitakis, uh, on the top, we see a side view of a turbulent boundary layer uh, and the flow is from left to right. We see these large billowing motions leaning over at some characteristic angles. Those are the large scales, the outer part, the eddies in the outer part of the boundary layer they're expected to scale with delta. We also see in the bullet picture below that a, a, a plan view. It's a, in fact uh, looking up through the floor of the, of the surface on which the boundary layer is developing. We're looking up through that floor and what we're seeing is the near wall motions uh, uh, close to the surface. And these motions, we have a very streaky structure we can see that, and the spacing between those streaks is about 100 viscous uh, length scales. And the viscous length scale is defined as the viscosity, viscosity is important, the kinematic viscosity at the wall, divided by our velocity scale, U tau, that gives us a length scale. And that's the viscous length scale, and that's the scale that um, the near wall motion, motions uh, scale with. So. If we form a ratio of this outer and inner length scale, then we have delta over eta V, 
uh, which gives us delta u tau over nu wall, and that's a, a Reynolds number, it's non-dimensional, and that's the Reynolds number I will use, it's called the friction Reynolds number. Now, another expectation, this time on the mean flow, is that a higher, at high Reynolds numbers, there's an overlap region where we have a log law in the mean velocity profile. And this is sort of like our turbulence bedrock in some respects. Um, and it can be derived in a number of different ways. One is through this sort of overlap argument, a scaling, a dimensional, non-dimensional scaling argument based on inner and outer scaling. The way it's expressed in the best possible way, I think, is to talk in terms of a velocity gradient. So somewhere in the region where the outer and inner scales overlap, uh, there might be this region where the velocity gradient uh, is given by u tau over kappa y. So it's inversely proportional to y. And kappa is a uh, constant called von, Kármán, von Kármán's constant. And if we integrate that, uh, you can see that we have this u plus, which is u over u tau, uh, is this logarithmic version of uh, a logarithmic variation uh, with y plus, which is the non-dimensional wall distance y u tau over nu. Now, I'm showing you here some uh, data from Nicarazzi in a pipe flow from 1932. And we plot this on a semi-log plot and we see that indeed u plus and y plus have this sort of semi-log relationship, at least within the scatter of the data, but over a decent Reynolds number range. You can see it goes from 200 uh, something to over uh, 50,000. So what's new? Well, uh, turns out that the value of kappa is in some uh, dispute. It's very hard to measure or determine the slope of uh, discrete data and so it's not surprising that the value of kappa has some uncertainty. And uh, there's also a question of where does the log law begin and where does it end? So to uh, answer those questions, you really need a sufficiently high Reynolds number. And we'll see that you really do need very high Reynolds numbers. Um, you also need accurate measurements of the velocity and you need accurate measurements of u tau. In other words, you need to measure the wall stress very accurately. So the first thing you need is high Reynolds number. So uh, at, at Princeton, we uh, build some purpose-built facilities to examine high Reynolds number flows under laboratory conditions. You know, you, to get accurate data, you really need to be able to control all the boundary conditions very well indeed. And so we chose to use high pressure uh, air at up to 200 atmospheres uh, and that will give us a very high Reynolds number in a modest sized facility. And on the left, you see what's called the uh, high Reynolds number turbulence facility. It's basically a wind tunnel that's used to look at boundary layers and other, and other things. And on the right, the green one is the super pipe where we can get Reynolds numbers from about 1,000 to about 500,000. 500,000 is a big number. Um, the other uh, facility that's uh, of interest today is the one shown on the right, and uh, that's the high Reynolds number boundary layer wind tunnel at Melbourne, uh, uh, Ivan Marusik's group, which is a facility that operates at atmospheric pressure, but because it's large, it has a 27 metre long working section, you can develop large boundary layer thicknesses, and so you get high Reynolds numbers up to about 30,000 in that facility. So we have a high Reynolds number. Now we need to have accurate measurements of the velocity and the wall stress. We certainly need the mean velocity better than 1%. And in our case, we chose to use uh, pedo probes, which have been around forever. Um, but if you want to get 1% accuracy on a pedo probe, we're actually trying to get better than that. Um, you need to be really careful. And so we spent actually quite a bit of time looking at how to make pedo probe measurements get this level of accuracy. And there are all sorts of corrections that you need to use. So you need to think about the lower Reynolds number effects, the, the shear or the gradient correction. There is a near wall correction because you get displacement of streamlines. There is a turbulence correction. 
And indeed, even if you have a pitot probe that measures the total pressure, you need to measure the static pressure somewhere to get the dynamic pressure. And if you use a wall pressure tapping, even that uh, turned out uh, we, we needed to uh, think about Reynolds number effects here to get the right uh, static pressure measurement. These corrections are all small and they're not important everywhere in the flow, but unless you take care of all of these things, you're not going to get the desired accuracy. The other thing you need is you need uh, to measure the friction velocity to better than 1%. And we can do that in pipe flow relatively easily because in a fully developed turbulent pipe flow, uh, of course, the um, pressure drop is related to the, to the shear stress at the wall. And so by measuring the pressure drop, uh, we can get UTAL accurately. Uh, pipes are really the best place to measure UTAL accurately. So what do we find? Well, this is a result uh, uh, from uh, Zagarola and Smiths and then uh, McEwen et al, um, where we show these velocity profile in this semi-log coordinate system. And we see that actually for quite a considerable distance close to the wall, instead of a log law, we see a power law. U plus is in this case, 8.47, Y plus to the 0.142, uh, which is almost one seventh power law. And then the log law uh, doesn't actually start until some distance away from the wall. Now, you can get a power law from the same kind of overlap argument that you use to get a log law, instead of matching the velocity gradients, that will give you a log law, you match the velocity gradients and the absolute magnitude of the velocity and you get a power law. So there's no reason why you can't get a power law or a log law, uh, depending on the assumptions you make. And it turns out in our case, we see this power law near the wall. So the log law in this case doesn't really begin until about a Y plus of 600, which is a lot bigger than what most people think. And um, if you look at textbooks, even modern textbooks, you'll see values quoted there of from anything from 30 to about 70, depending on what you read in which textbook you choose. And we find 600. So this is a lot further from the wall, showing that viscous effects continue to be important uh, even in this sort of overlap region. It ends in this case for a pipe at about Y over delta of 0.12. Again, textbooks will tell you 0.1 to 0.3. Um, it seems a bit uh, nebulous. It's, it's hard to tell where these things end, and that's why it's some, somewhat controversial. So the end result is that if it doesn't start at 600 and Y over delta is 0.12 is the end of it, then if you want to see the log law uh, over a distance of about one octave in Y plus, you need a Reynolds number greater than 10,000. If you want to see it for one decade, you need a Reynolds number greater than 50,000. And these are, again, as I said, big numbers compared to what most facilities are capable of. So when we have the log law, what about the value of kappa? That was one of our questions. Um, in this case, we found 0 0.421 as the slope of that log law. But we kept doing this experiment we kept doing it over and over. Every time we went in the pipe flow, you'd measure the mean velocity and you could take another look at what kappa was. And if you put the ensemble of the measurements together, even under these conditions where the velocities and the, 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 the friction velocity are measured to this level of accuracy, the uncertainty on the slope of that line is still rather large. And so I, I really, we all we can say is that at least on the basis of our measurements, is that cap is 0 0.40 plus or minus 0 0.02. Now, other people find more precise values. Um, I'm not sure about that because here we are in uh, very well controlled conditions and we have this level of uncertainty. So the question is, can DNS help? Well, uh, let's take a look at uh, some channel flow DNS by uh, Lee and Moser, um, 2015, maximum Reynolds number of 5,200. And on the left there, I show this indicator function from their paper. Um, uh, you can see it's plotting y plus du dy uh, non-dimensionally. 
And so what that should be is that should be a constant in this uh, region where there's a log law. And you can see there is indeed a, a point of inflection for this highest Reynolds number case. It's not very long, uh, but it seems to indicate maybe there's a log law. Now, actually, um, if you take the DNS data and you replot it in the same way as I showed the superpipe velocity profiles, you can see that actually over this Reynolds number range, the, uh, the mean velocity really follows the same power law that I showed from the superpipe, 8.47 y plus to the 0.142 uh, over this Reynolds number range. Maybe not for the highest Reynolds number, it's a bit uncertain, but certainly I don't think this data is enough to be able to give us a better value of kappa. Um, and so uh, we're really looking for higher DNS. I'm not sure that experiments will actually tell us what kappa is. I think it's going to take DNS to do it. Let's look at the turbulence. So this is now Reynolds number scaling of turbulence. And we have some expectations about that. And probably the best or the most renowned expectation that we have is based on uh, Townsend's attached eddy hypothesis, uh, where he said that the velocity fields of the main eddies, and what he meant was these other pictures that I show uh, there, uh, in this overlap region of the mean velocity, uh, really the sort of constant stress region near the wall, um, we have these motions, the main eddies, they carry the shear stress, the, if they regarded as persistent organized flow patterns, they extend to the wall and in a sense they're attached to the wall. What this means is that they scale with the distance from the wall, a bit like the velocity gradient, one over y. And here it's the uh, uh, the scaling of the the, the the length scale of the eddies in this overlap region is y, the distance from the wall. And when you do that, um, you or you, you can derive this expectation that the turbulence intensity follows a logarithmic uh, variation in the wall distance. What I show there is actually a sort of viscous version that was uh, derived by uh, Perry and uh, et al. Um, in that there is a viscous correction term. This was derived actually from scaling the, uh, the spectrum and integrating the spectrum to get the turbulence intensity. We would expect that viscous term Vy plus to go to zero as the Reynolds number goes to infinity. And we're hoping to get to near enough or close enough to infinity to see that Vy is zero. So to show that log long, we know that we're going to need high Reynolds numbers. Certainly Reynolds numbers greater than 5,000. Uh, from DNS and experiments, uh, we know that that is an insufficient Reynolds number to show this logarithmic distribution. And also, we're going to need better measurements of the turbulence. And to do better measurements, I mean, typically what people use to measure turbulence intensities are a hot wire anemometers. The hot wire filament is of the order of, say, a half a millimeter in length. Uh, and uh, what that means is that in cases of very high Reynolds number, where some eddies can be very small, there can be spatial filtering effects, they can also be insufficient frequency response. And so this idea of developing a new probe uh, was to try to solve some of those problems. And so we developed uh, over some years this uh, nanoscale thermal anemometry probe, uh, which we call NSTEP. It's based on uh, using a MEMS construction uh, uh, approach. Uh, we end up with a freestanding platinum ribbon. This is our sensor. It's called a wire, but it's not really a wire. It, 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 it's actually a, 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 a flat ribbon. It's about 100 nanometers in thickness, two microns in cross section. And we can make them in different lengths from 30 to about 60 microns in this case. Uh, mostly we've used the 30 micron at the high Reynolds number end to get better spatial resolution. You know, that, that's, and you can see that this is at least an order of magnitude smaller than hot wires. And the frequency response is greater than 150 kilohertz because the thermal inertia of the sensors is so small. So we don't have any problems with the frequency response. So this is good. Now we have a new tool. So we go and measure the turbulence intensity in the superpipe, 
And this is a Reynolds number range from about 2,000 to about 100,000. And we see that by plotting the turbulence intensity versus Y over delta, we see that indeed this logarithmic variation appears without the viscous correction at a high enough Reynolds number. So this is this was really nice because uh, we were able to establish this result, this prediction from the Townsend Perry attached eddy model um, and actually confirmed that this is so. And what's more is that this log law is holds for uh, pipes and boundary layers and the uh, slope doesn't change. The, the, the additive constant, uh, it depends on the flow, but the slope of 1.25 is the same for pipes and boundary layers. Very nice general result. We have another expectation, um, at least two different expectations for the turbulence intensity distributions. Um, there may or may not be an outer peak and near the wall, the turbulence intensity continues to increase with Reynolds number. It's called the inner peak. How does that vary with Reynolds number? So what I show on the right is a collection of pipe flow data that was collected in about 2010. And what we show is all the available measurements in pipe flows. Uh, and we see quite an enormous amount of scatter. Some of this is due to Reynolds number variation. Some of this is due to um, um, problems with the sensor. All these measurements were taken with hot wire anemometers, some of it with LDV at lower Reynolds numbers. Uh, so two things you see, increasing Reynolds number, there appears to be an outer peak uh, developing. Those are the measurements by Morrison et al. Um, a similar peak was seen by Fenolds and Finley earlier, but both of those sets of data are really affected by spatial resolution. So it's not quite sure whether that peak is there or whether the peak just appears because as you get closer to the wall where the eddies are smaller, the spatial resolution is going to kill you. The other part, of course, the inner peak is even closer to the wall. So spatial resolution is even a bigger issue there. So, um, so there's some questions about what the behavior of this outer peak or inner peak or whether there even is an outer peak is a, is a question. So here are our measurements um, using the end step in the super pipe. And we see indeed that there is the appearance of an outer peak in that region there, the, uh, the uh, uh, NSEP uh, has uh, full spatial resolution. There's no question that it's measuring, uh, there's no spatial filtering going on. So we can be very confident about the appearance of the outer peak. The inner peak was a bit more interesting though, because what we found is that it sort of grew for a while and then it stopped. And we originally thought that this was kind of some saturation of the near wall turbulence, but as it turns out, that's not quite the answer. For example, if we take the peak magnitude and we plot that versus the Reynolds number, which you see on the left there, uh, this, uh, there is, uh, this was taken, the, the graph was taken from uh, Lee and Moser. Um, we see that the DNS uh, data uh, is following one uh, uh, slope. The uh, Melbourne tunnel, this is the big tunnel that we were talking about, hot wire measurements gives you this. And our in-step measurements in the superpipe were doing that. So what's going on there? Um, well, as it turns out, we still have a spatial resolution problem in the end, in the superpipe using NSTEP when we get close to the wall. We applied corrections for that, but the corrections simply weren't good enough uh, to see this uh, uh, variation in the inner peak. So we need a bigger facility. And so we went to Melbourne. And so we went to the Melbourne uh, wind tunnel, the big one, uh, and we took the end steps uh, to the wind tunnel there. And in that case, because the boundary layer thickness is so large, the uh, viscous uh, length scale, or the, if we take the wire length L uh, compared to the viscous length scale, we see that it's only about three times larger. And that's about the size of the Kolmogorov length scale in the near wall region. So we were very confident that we could get uh, accurate turbulence measurements. And indeed, when we now plot the velocity, pro, uh, the turbulence intensity profiles up to a Reynolds number of 20,000, we see indeed that there's, first of all, there's a, there's a 
appearance of an outer peak. It's not very obvious here because the Reynolds numbers are not really high enough, but we do see the inner peak um, monotonically increasing with Reynolds number. And that uh, is in accordance with um, measurements at lower Reynolds numbers and the DNS uh, data uh, from Lee and Moser and other people. And so we see what it looks like a logarithmic variation increase of the peak value with Reynolds number. So everything seems to be in order. Now, why does the inner peak grow with Reynolds number? It's a good question. Um, can we get somewhere using uh, some analytical approach? And so uh, what we've done recently is to use a Taylor series expansion for small distances from the wall. Um, so what we do there is just write the Taylor series expansion in small y plus. If the y plus in the limit going to the wall, we see that the turbulence intensity goes as y plus squared. The constant is fu squared, a uh, bit of an awkward notation, I apologize for that, but that's just the mean square value of B1 in the Taylor series expansion. Um, and that uh, we can find that value using DNS. We, it's very hard to find experimentally because we need to go really close to the wall to be able to measure that uh, uh, constant. So let's use the DNS that I showed before, the channel flow DNS on the left. I see the uh, scaling with uh, the usual scaling with u tau squared. And we see the peak growing in magnitude as before. If I now uh, take the same data and plot it divided by y plus squared, then the, as the limit we go to y plus of zero, um, this fu squared uh, you can see is taking a constant value and we can then evaluate that it's, it, 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 it increases with Reynolds number, but we can find that value using the DNS. So then something interesting happens. If I take the original data shown on the left and I then divide it by the value of FU squared that I found by looking at the wall um, as Y plus goes to zero, I see that it actually collapses the, uh, the turbulence intensity profiles using this scaling with FU squared. Um, so that's interesting. Um, also, it turns out that the peak value of the turbulence intensity, the inner peak value, is almost exactly 46 times FU squared. Now, I, 46 is it's not a magic number. It's, it's you know, uh, there's no restaurant at the end of the universe. But it's, it's a very interesting number. It's constant uh, over the Reynolds number range, certainly as you get to higher Reynolds numbers. Now, I have that information. And so I can go back to the data that we took at Melbourne on the left, and I scale it with this FU squared, and I see it collapses the turbulence intensity profiles almost exactly. And so now we see the collapse is even better. Uh, instead of being the peak and a little bit more, we see that it essentially collapses the data for a Y plus up to about 50. So very nice result. Well, uh, what does it mean? Well, that's a hard question, of course. Um, if you look at what FU squared is, uh, it's, um, of course, the mean square of the instantaneous velocity fluctuations at the wall. Um, and um, Velocity, gradient of velocity fluctuations. And that can be interpreted as in terms of the shear stress fluctuations at the wall also. But the interesting thing is to think about the scale decomposition of FU squared. What's contributing to FU squared? So on the left, you see the blue squares show you how FU squared varies with Reynolds number. And then if we just look at the contribution due to the smaller scales, the ones with wavelengths, uh, less than a thousand, we see that that's more or less constant with Reynolds number. That's the orange curve. And then as Reynolds number increases, the large scales, that's the ones with the uh, wavelengths larger than a thousand, are starting to contribute more and more and more. So 
this is now well known uh, because, um, you know, for example, Ivan Marusik and his group showed this kind of uh, modulation and superimposition of the near wall motions by large outer scale motions. Uh, and here we see it uh, developing in this FU squared term. Now that, you know, that FU squared is directly related to the peak value. And so uh, when we look at the um, contributions to the turbulence intensity at the peak, we see this very similar result. We see the small scale contributions are essentially constant with Reynolds number and the large scale contributions become more and more important as the Reynolds number goes up. And the other thing that it says is that the, uh, the at the wall, where FU squared is, is evaluated and the peak value are doing exactly the same thing. So this modulation and superimposition is affecting the entire near wall region and at high Reynolds numbers, at least up to a Y plus of 50. It's all being pushed around by the outer scale motions. And that's what's causing it to increase with Reynolds number. Now, summarize Reynolds number scaling. We have that experimental computation that revealed many new aspects of wall bandwidth flows. For example, the mean flow log law, where it starts and so on. We have a power law. The there's a turbulence log law that's been shown. There's, we know about the outer peak. We know about the inner peak. Um, we certainly need high Reynolds numbers to understand this high Reynolds number behavior, certainly greater than 10,000. Now, in the past, the experiments were the only way to get high Reynolds numbers. But DNS is coming along quickly. For example, if I plot um, the Reynolds number is achieved in the DNS of channel flow with time, we see an almost uh, uh, semi-logarithmic uh, 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 increase. You know, this is the Morse law for channel flow. Um, and we see um, the uh, Lee and Moser at 5,200 at, uh, in 2015. And we see uh, another data point at about at 10,000. And that is indeed coming along. That's uh, there are some uh, uh, results have been reported by Martin Oberlack, and we'll soon see the full data set at a channel flow Reynolds number of 10,000. We might actually be able to find the value of kappa in a channel flow. Who knows? Now, I want to spend the remaining time uh, to think about Mark number scaling. How have advances in experiment and computation helped our understanding of boundary layers in high Mach number flow? So, a bit of a uh, change of gear. To illustrate what the mean flow looks like in high-speed boundary layer, I show these results by Wat Watson et al. Uh, in a Mach number of 10 flow using helium. So, it's a, it's, it's a perfect gas at this Mach number. And one of the things that's immediately obvious, if I look at uh, the velocity profile, this uh, U over U infinity, we see that it looks very much like what we might expect to see in a subsonic flow. It's, it's actually different, but superficially it looks the same. What is hugely different, of course, is that there's a, a temperature uh, gradient across the boundary layer, which in this case, uh, increases the temperature from the free stream to the wall by a factor greater than 30. That means that the density is changing enormously across this shear layer. Um, the pressure is constant across the boundary layers that would be in subsonic flow. So the temperature and the density are directly connected. So in thinking about turbulent boundary layers in high speed flows, we need to account for the density changes. Now, what did we know or we expect in compressible flow? So back to our questions, uh, uh, what we think that we know or what we do know. And one thing is that the Van Dries transformation collapses the mean velocity profile into the incompressible form of the log law and the incompressible form of the wake. And now what is the Van Dries transformation? If we start by saying high-speed flows also have an overlap region between inner and outer scaling, we get a log law. In this case, it's best expressed again as in terms of the velocity gradient being proportional to one over y. The important difference is that it, the instead of using u tau, which had the density at the wall, we now use a velocity scale, which is has um, the density, the local density at given height y. 
So when we integrate that, we now get what's called the Van Dries transformation, which accounts for this uh, density variation by the temperature variation. And as I said, we can write that in terms of a velocity scale, which is related to UTAL, but it has this density variation. It accounts for this density variation. This is U star, this velocity, uh, this new velocity scale. And when we look at some data, this is some recent data by Owen Williams at Princeton. Uh, this is a Mark 7.5 flow. And the top uh, 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 graph shows you the classic scaling using U tau. And then the bottom one shows you the Van Dries scaling. Um, and you can see that the Van Dries scaling pushes that velocity profile right on top of um, you know, a more or less accepted version of this logarithmic law near the wall. Uh, as we said, it's not quite a logarithmic law, but uh, for today's purposes, it's close enough. Um, and then we see the, uh, the wake uh, developing, and that's just because these are increasing at increasing Reynolds numbers. So that's very encouraging. Um, the other part is that what does the turbulence look like? Well, um, we believe that Mach number effects are only through the mean density. And this is a big statement because there are large density fluctuations in these flows as well. And, um, but they're, they're really not important for scaling the turbulence intensities, even at high Mach number. And there's DNS and experiments to, uh, to support that. But I'll, uh, I'll, for today, I'll just show you the pictures. Um, two pictures on the right, the top ones are the Mark 2.8 using acetone droplet visualizations. Uh, with a laser sheet, and we see compare that to Bob Falco's picture of a, of a turbulent boundary layer um, at Mach number of zero. It's hard to tell the difference. Um, we can tell the top one is at a higher Reynolds number because there's more fine scales, um, but the overall uh, structure of this boundary layer with large intermittent regions of non-turbulent flow is 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 very obvious, at least qualitatively. I like these pictures uh, taken by filtered Rayleigh scattering by Mike Smith. Um, and what we see here is slightly lower mark number and we see a side view and we see a plan view at about uh, three quarters of the way through the boundary layer. And you can see in this plan view, these patches of non-turbulent fluid and these patches of turbulent fluid indicated like clouds on a summer afternoon. I really do like those pictures. Um, so what about the turbulence expectations that follow from this kind of thinking? Morkoven suggested that uh, we can collapse these turbulent stress profiles into the incompressible data, at least for the overlap region and the outer flow. So what do I mean? On the right-hand side, um, we have classic scaling of the turbulence intensity for uh, a number of Mach numbers. We use the RMS value here. Um, because uh, turbulence data in supersonic flows is generally rather scattered and you can make it look a lot better if you look at the square root rather than the, uh, the, squared, uh, the mean square value. Uh, in any case, we can see that as the, Reynolds, as the Mach number increases from 0 to 4.7, this turbulence intensity decreases with Mach number. Well, Morkoven suggested that the essential dynamics of these shear flows will follow the incompressible pattern if we use the local density instead of the wall density. So it's very similar thinking to what uh, the Van Dries transformation uh, required. Instead of using the velocity scale U tau, we use the velocity scale U star. That varies with Y because the density is varying with Y. But if I take this data from uh, Kistler, taken with hot wires, rescale them using um, the Klebanoff data then I see that indeed, um, oh, sorry, uh, using the, um, uh, the uh, Morkoven scaling, indeed it collapses the velocity profile. It looks very encouraging, right? Well, now you take all the data that, that, that I could find, and this is up to a mark number of 11, and you can see that although um, the Morkoven scaling here does a little bit better than the classic scaling, uh, the scatter is still enormous, and it's because these measurements are really hard to do. Um, 
Hot wires typically have inadequate frequency response at these high speed flows. They have mixed mode, they depend on temperature and velocity. Uh, there's inadequate spatial resolution. These shear layers are usually very thin. So we have a big problem. And so um, what about using PIV? Now, PIV is particle image velocimetry. And what you do is you uh, seed the flow with particles illuminated with a laser sheet. You take two pictures, very uh, 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 a short time delay. You correlate the two images. And what you get is you get a spatial image of the velocity field. Big thing is that the particles need to follow the flow. And so when you're doing experiments at a Mach number of eight or seven or something, and the velocities are uh, more than a kilometer per second, Temperatures are very high to stop it from to stop the flow from freezing on the expansion. And when you're using particles, uh, titanium dioxide particles at two microns diameter, you have to be very careful to uh, understand what the particles are seeing. You need to model the particle response to get good results. And as Owen Williams showed, you need to include inertia effects, compressibility, and slip because uh, non-continuum effects become important on the particle scale. So here we have some results uh, by Owen at uh, a Mach number of 7.5. On the left, you see some instantaneous picture of the velocity field. Um, it looks very much like a turbulent boundary layer. It's a bit of color fluid dynamics. Um, on the right are the quantitative results. And we see that when we go from a more coven, uh, classic scaling on the top to more coving scaling at the bottom, we do indeed collapse the velocity profiles, uh, the, the turbulence intensity profiles in this region here. We see this behavior that the peak gets pushed closer to the wall with increasing Reynolds number. That's what we expect. And we see very good agreement really with the uh, DNS of pre Martin in uh, 2011. So it all looks good. I agree with the DNS. Shows the expected behavior with increasing Reynolds number, supports more Coven scaling. But as it turns out, our measurements of the wall normal fluctuations are nowhere near what they should be, uh, even when we use more Coven scaling. And the shear stress is uh, uh, under measured by about 50%. So it just turns out it's very difficult to measure the wall component, uh, uh, wall normal component V prime. And this is a general result for hot wires. PIV and everything else. It's uh, experimentally, it just seems a very, very difficult quantity to measure at high Mach numbers. So what about DNS? Here's some results uh, from Pino Martin's group um, showing results at matched Reynolds numbers, close enough to Reynolds numbers, um, but a Mach number range of 0.3 to Mach number of 12 and you can see that for all the three components of turbulence, as we go from um, classic scaling on the left to more coving scaling on the right, all the velocity, all the profiles collapse. So more coving scaling is working according to the DNS. And these are uh, small box results from 2011. Big box results are coming along uh, soon, and I believe they show the same result. So let's summary. This is a summary of the whole talk. It's now obvious that fundamental studies of turbulence must be performed as a partnership between experiment and DNS. You can see the important role played by both of these. Some questions can still only be answered by experiment. Some questions can only be answered by DNS. And for canonical flows, I think that DNS will very soon provide the necessary information for future understanding instead of experiment. I, I really think that. Um, of course, beyond canonical flows in subsonic flows, there are enormous opportunities for experimental work to investigate some of these real life effects like pressure gradients, streamline curvature, divergence, sudden perturbation, steps, uh, roughness changes, etc. And in high mark number, um, heat transfer becomes important. You know, the flow becomes a reacting flow. There could be ablation effects, all of these things incredibly difficult to measure experimentally. And I think that's where DNS is going to be um, the primary tool for understanding those flows. And just to emphasize this change of thinking, in 2011, high mark number DNS was validated using experiments. 
and in 2021, high mark number experiments are validated by DNS. So there's really a sea change in thinking. I'm going to leave you with this, what I call the ascent of fluid mechanics. This is a cartoon that Tony Perry drew around 1980. Uh, that's over 40 years ago, for those of us who can count. Um, on the left is sort of our brain on fluid mechanics, and this would be like in the 19th century. And then as we get into the 20th century, we see experiment and theory uh, supporting our thinking. And there's a bit of numerics here uh, represented by this slide rule, kind of propping up the back of this brain. Uh, but by, you know, the mid-century, 20th century, we see CFD really starting to be a third leg to this uh, thinking about fluid mechanics. And, of course, uh, in 1980, uh, Tony postulated that computers were going to put muscles in both experiment and theory to uh, continue our thinking about fluid mechanics. And I think that's a rather prescient kind of um, uh, thinking, considering that was, as I said, more than 40 years ago. So I wanted to thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity to talk today. Um, this work was supported by uh, very generous funding from uh, AFOSR, NASA, uh, NSF, and particularly ONR over many years. Um, I have a whole bunch of graduate students and, and, and postdocs and visitors to thank. They just, it's been a marvelous experience working with them. And I've highlighted some of those people who contributed to the, today's talk. And then there are a number of people at the bottom there who have helped me along the way, um, in many ways collaborated with, talked with, supported me, uh, and it's just been a pleasure to have had that experience. So thank you very much. Well, on this very last uh, music note uh, of the cartoon, uh, thank you so much, Lax, for this very clear presentation of such amazing and breakthrough results, while also sharing the enormous challenges along the way and how you were able to overcome them. This was truly a in very inspiring lecture for all of us. I believe that we have now time for one or two questions, perhaps. Um, I'd like to call upon the audience to use the chat feature in Zoom if you have a question for Lax. How the wall bounded turbulence scaling would change in case of an enhanced surface roughness of the wall? Do you have any novel experimental result to recommend? Um. Yes, you know, roughness is, uh, of course, going to change a lot of things near the wall. Um, in a fully rough flow, um, then, uh, of course, the, um, the the flow essentially becomes independent of Reynolds number because, um, for example, if you look at the skin friction coefficient for fully rough walls, they're, in, they're constant, independent of Reynolds number. So it's an interesting place to, 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 to look at uh, in sense of, it mimics a high, an infinite Reynolds number case, but only for the outer layer. It doesn't tell you anything about the inner layer because that's, of course, destroyed by the presence of the roughness. Now, roughness is a huge uh, topic and it's hugely important to practical applications. And there are many, many people working in this field. Um, there was a wonderful review by Javier Jimenez some years ago, uh, and uh, that, that would be obviously a starting place. Um, but there are some excellent experiments available and there's also coming along some excellent DNS in that respect as well. Thank you very much, Lax. Okay, the second question is, having been active in turbulence asymptotics for years, I find that the current challenges not so much concern the well-understood two-tiered attached boundary layers, but internal and gross separation, 3D flows and transition. Yeah. As an outstanding experimentalist, would you agree on on that much more experimental effort should be put on these topics to confirm, for example, scaling laws and the high Reynolds number structure of turbulent separation? Couldn't agree more. Absolutely. I fully support that view. I, I you know, um, these canonical flows have been of great interest, you know, because they really do get some fundamentals about turbulence. But when we think about the real world, um, uh, you know, anywhere 
where there's a turbulent boundary layer on a vehicle, we have these multiple different effects occurring, roughness, curvature, um, pressure gradients, three-dimensional effects. Yes, we do need to spend more time on looking at those flows. And I think that's exactly where experiments uh, should be headed um, because that's where you can really make the contribution in the future. Thank you, Lex, uh, and thank you so much for all the questions. Unfortunately, I have only five minutes uh, left for this session on my clock. So I'd like to uh, um, ask for the other uh, people who had questions uh, to reach out to Lex by email, perhaps, uh, or uh, on the chat directly to him. Um, so thank you very much, Lex, for such an outstanding lecture. Uh, I particularly um, enjoyed your reconciliation of data from different um, experimental facilities um, and, and the role uh, of DNS as well, uh, numerical simulations and theory that you pointed out. Um, so congratulations on being awarded this uh, um, prestigious lecture and, and prize. Next, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to Cambridge University Press for their generosity in sponsoring the prize, particularly Kathleen Tu, who has been a pleasure to work with. Um, it's now my honor to introduce Kathleen, who will present the Bachelor Prize to Professor Lex Smith on behalf of the Journal of Fluid Mechanics and Cambridge University Press. Kathleen. Thank you again, Lex, for this beautiful talk, and Nadine for the introduction and the chairing of this session. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. My name is Kathleen Tu, and I am currently the executive publisher for the STM journals at Cambridge University Press. Here at Cambridge, we are extremely delighted and honored to have partnered with IUTAM for the sponsorship of such a prestigious award. As mentioned by Nadine, it was 65 years ago in 1956 that George Batchelor founded the Journal of Fluid Mechanics. At that time, he was only 36 years old. And in 2020, we celebrated George Bachelor's centenary by inviting several leading authors to contribute to a special volume in JFM dedicated to his name. I am pleased to say that all the invited papers have been published in volume 914 and that the JFM volume is free to access in perpetuity. JFM continues to grow in size and strength. We are also excited that the companion journal to JFM called Flow was also launched during the Bachelor Centenary celebrations. The first few articles have now been published and the journal is open access. I would like to encourage everyone to take a look at the new journal and its scope and how we are continuing George's vision for the fluid mechanics community. Between March and June this year, we also invited all of the previous Bachelor Prize winners and several leading authors, as well as early career scientists, to present their invited papers online via webinars, which were also dedicated to George. You will be able to find all the talks and discussions freely available on our website or via YouTube. Today, we are really delighted to continue to honor George Bachelor via this excellent Bachelor Prize lecture. The Bachelor Prize is awarded every four years to a single scientist for outstanding research in fluid dynamics, recognizing research which has been published during the last 10 year period. And I am indebted to the great work of the Bachelor Prize Selection Committee, who has to read so many papers and assess the hundreds of applications that we received. So thank you very much to the committee for their hard work. Thank you also to all who nominated researchers for this prize. I have the honor today to present the Bachelor Prize 2020 to Professor Lex Smith for his seminal contributions to our understanding of the structure of wall bound turbulence at the very large Reynolds and Mach numbers, especially through the design of innovative experiments and measurement devices, and also for his pioneering work on bio inspired propulsion and on drag reduction modified, um, using modified surfaces. We commissioned a special glass design from an artist based in the UK, inspired by this Bachelor Prize talk on measurements in wall bounded turbulence. Here is a picture of it, and I am sure that Lex can show the artwork in real time. 
Many congratulations again to Lex for winning this prestigious award. And over to Lex now for some final words. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Nadine. Um, it's been a great pleasure to give this talk. It's a wonderful honor to get uh, uh, to be recognized in this way. And as uh, Kathleen promised, I, I can show you the award here. Um, I, it, it, it may not come across uh, as impressively across with the, uh, this video link, but it's quite a remarkable uh, piece of glass. And it's 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 extraordinary, really. I had no idea it was going to end up looking quite this wonderful. So thank you for that. Thank you for Kathleen. Uh, thank you, Nadine. It's it's been a great place here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathleen and Lex. Congratulations again, Lex. Um, and thank you so much to all for joining us today. Thank you.